Uh, so hi guys, I'm, uh, I'm T, the CEO of Maltis. This is my co-founder, Theo. Uh, so we're building a bank for companies using crypto, to help companies use crypto and earn interest on it. Um, so today I'm going to talk about software composability, which is a key things, a key concept that we're using to build our stack, our banking stack. Uh, I'll first start with a, you know, a few introduction, a little introduction about on what we do, so that you can understand how we use those different bricks that I'm going to cover. Um, the, the third part will be on, uh, on why, a very short part on why we think that composability is the way forward for bank uh, to invent itself and to you know, um, provide innovative services to, to, the, to the end users. Uh, and we will briefly cover two of the main challenges we have today um, in this you know, uh, journey of building a new banking stack, which are UX, obviously, uh, a topic that most of you are probably familiar with, and uh, compliance as well. So um, we uh, so we started the we started the company. Uh, so we've been in the space for quite some time now, and we realized that there are, there's no um, there's no wallet adapted for business, designed for business today in the crypto space. So either you're going to have an individual wallet, which could be your Ledger, uh, Nano, which could be your MetaMask, or you know many of other options, or you will have a very heavy custodial solutions are uh, really often designed for institutionals, for example. So this whole spectrum uh, of companies that do not have a solution to run a payroll, to pay suppliers, to earn interest, basically to run business on crypto. So we are effectively turning wallets, so we're using the, the, the Gnosis Multisig, so we're turning this wallet into what we call a crypto bank with essentially the same services you would expect from traditional banking. So we provide a checking account so that you can buy, sell, store, pay, and receive. We provide savings accounts so that you can earn interest on the crypto you're not using. And we provide um, spending policies and features to enable your team to spend on the go, um, you know, to know at all time where the company money goes, where it went. Um, so again, we're building a crypto bank. So we're building all the financial utilities you would expect from your traditional business bank. Um, this is us today, which is what I mentioned. Uh, we're building accounting exports as well, uh, so that the, your company can have transaction history. Um, we're going to support Bitcoin as well and provide a really banking-like experience with fiat accounts and a mobile experience. The financial utilities I mentioned also include recurring payments, um, additional business tools like invoice financing or even borrowing on top of the lending experience we already provide with the interest rates. Um, so we are obviously bullish on crypto, um, which is why we started with crypto. Uh, we think it's the, um, um, probably it's a game changer for payment, especially for cross-border payments. And we believe that with stable coins, um, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a very um, seamless, convenient way and cheap way to send money abroad to move all around. So we believe in this, at least in this very specific use case. But at the same time. You will always, I mean, at least within, for the next 10 or 20 years, you will always pay your, you know, your, your, your team dinner in fiat, for example. You will still use your euros, your dollars. So we need to build a bank that is effectively merging those two very separate worlds together. We need interoperability between fiat and crypto. Um, this is what we're building. Uh, just like you had mobile first bank after traditional banks, you will have crypto bank. We're building the first crypto first bank for businesses. Um, so now that I gave this intro on what we're doing, obviously we need to explain how we do it. Um, and I'm going to introduce this very simple concept of composability. So software composability is the ability to combine various components of a stack, different software pieces in different ways to offer multiple combinations to effectively build um, you know, your, whole, your whole stack. Um, some call it, in the, DeFi, in the DeFi space, some call it money legals. Uh, basically, the idea is the same. You combine different pieces together. You can have an infinite number of combinations to build use cases for your end user, from infrastructure to the application layer. Um, so I use this word money legos, but essentially, I mean, the, um, the goal of using composability is to provide financial utilities. Uh, and those financial utilities, again, are the services you expect from your bank. Those are the verb that the crypto space today lacks. So those verbs are very simple. Uh, it's store, it's earn. I mean, I'll give you some examples here. Borrow, trade, many of them, just to, to build the financial system 
that we already know, the traditional banking system. So we need to use the same verbs, which are use cases in the crypto space as well. So how do we do that at Multis? Well, again, if I go back to one of the features I mentioned, which is our checking account, we use different kind of bricks. We put them together and our job is to make them very easy to use with a convenient interface. So here, if you look at the at this stack, obviously simplified. So we have the Ethereum, which is, which is the back end. This is, I mean, the core of everything we do. Then we would use what we call the Vault protocol to store your crypto. We're using the Gnosis Multisig wallet here. We're using ERC20 because we're using stable coins. Um, um, because again, we believe that stable coins are a game changer for businesses because you know, they're not exposed to volatility. We're using ENS so that you can conveniently send crypto to someone without using a huge and long chain of characters. So ENS is basically something like, rather than having a chain of characters, you would have, a, like, you know, for example, t.maltis.co, uh, rather than having this, this, this chain of characters. Again, we're making it very convenient at the interface level. So we are the Web2 provider, essentially, because we're providing a very simple interface on top of all those bricks. And we're using Podis or MetaMask, which are tools to sign your transactions. So those act as some kind of blockchain ID. So you need all of this to provide the feature we call a checking account. This is a good example of composability. So if you look at the interface now, can I do this from here? Yes. So if you look at, if you look at the interface now, you can see that all those bricks together, combined together, can give this. A very simple way to show your balance, your assets, to show the activity of the account, and transaction history just like a regular business bank. But everything is built with crypto bricks through composability. We obviously, so as the Web2 provider, we obviously you know, uh, add some, some, some additional layers of data uh, so that you can you know, make this transaction history very convenient, um, you know, accounting ready. Now, Let's go through another example. So savings account. So again, this is nope. This is another good example. So here, again, Ethereum money protocol. Again, you have the vault protocol when you store your money. But this time, we're using, so again, we're using stable coins because we are effectively lending those stable coins. And compound, compound, which is a lending protocol. So all those bricks. So we, we, we keep some of these bricks and we combine them with others to provide a different use case. In this case, again, the savings accounts. So again, if we go to the interface. Maybe you can zoom a little bit. On the interface? So here, from your dashboard, maybe a little bit less. So from your dashboard, everything gets simplified and you can just do two actions. Lend your crypto. <laughs> lend your crypto, or withdraw it. Two simple actions, thanks to many different bricks. Again, we have also a decentralized exchange. We have some exchange features. Same core bricks, Gnosis, Mutisic, Ethereum, but this time we're using Kyber, which is another protocol, a decentralized exchange protocol that gives you access to 70 tokens. Room and Moodpay, which are two other providers um, that enables companies to switch from fiat to crypto. And again, same interfaces. And everything is very simplified at the interface layer so that you can simply um, just swap your tokens here to any kind of the, any of the 70 tokens available on Kyber or buy and sell fiat against crypto through credit card or bank transfers. Again, same thing, multiple bricks to enable those verbs, those simple features. Um, we, we did the same thing with, the, with insurance. So, now the, so this one is a little bit different because here, so the, the risk sharing protocol we're using to provide this kind of covers on your phones uh, is actually covering against hack and failures at the protocol level. So it's not like a, a regular insurance covering the funds effectively, they're covering smart contract bugs. If those smart contracts have bugs, which result in a financial loss, then this protocol will automatically um, help you recover funds. Maybe a last example. 
on direct transfers. Um, so direct transfers is one of the business spending solutions I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, it's, it's a cool feature to, to, to enable your company to spend on the go, your, sorry, your team to spend on the go without requiring confirmations that you would need from your, um, you know, your standard multi-signature wallet. So in this case, using stable coins, using the smart contract called allowances that we developed, and ENS, you can, uh, you can have, you can, you, you can streamline, basically streamline spending, um, business spending. So if we go back to the interface, uh, yep. So here, I can send. So does anyone has a um, an ENS name that we can use? It's an Argent it's not Argent ENS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. So it's napoleon.argent.xyz. Napoleon.argent.xyz. Okay, Napoleon. So let's send you some die. Which, so usually, if you send some, uh, some, uh, any ERC20 today uh, using a standard multi signature wallet, uh, you, would, you would need confirmation from the owners of the wallet. Which means, if you want to have people in your team spending crypto, you need to make them owners, so give them credentials. You don't want that for one of your, your office manager, for example. So you want to find a way to give her a budget so that she can spend on the go, which is what we're doing right now. So we can send one die, enable direct transfers, say coffee, and there we go. And you just got a free coffee. So this is the, this is the, Metama, the, the parties in Metamas Bricks, uh, which, which uh, enable uh, and obviously, because we changed the login, we had to. Shall we go through that? Ah, it's fine. So we'll send you the the, the die a bit later. <laughs> so otherwise, we have to go to the one password. We changed the we changed the wi the Wi-Fi network. So it's a good security uh, security thing, though. Um, all right. So now let's uh, let's talk again about composability and why we think that's that's the way forward for for crypto banking, for building a, a whole new and innovative stack that's going to benefit from a benefit to the, to the, to the end users. Uh, so this is a stack today. So that's a, a stack from BNP Paribas. Um, so historically, banks have always tried to build everything internally to, you know, um, the, 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 this whole industry has been characterized by, by vertical integration. So you basically hire, you know, you spend billions and billions, you hire consultants, uh, <laughs> loads of them. I used to work in a bank, so I can tell you about that. Um, you have a huge team of developers, and you spend 20 years building this. Now, the reason why you're doing that is that you want to protect every data you get, you're gathering, especially your user's data. Um, that's the way you're going to capture volume. That's the way you're going to lock user in. Um, providing those bricks as well and building them enables you to have better economies of scale, especially if you own the infrastructure. So you end up having banks fighting against their peers. Um, you know, you end up with a small bunch, a small amount of banks competing against each other, which have no incentives to innovate. They're just building huge fortresses to protect themselves. That's what they do. Which is why today uh, they have accumulated a huge technical debt, which which stops them from, uh, you know, from. You know, actually responding to their users' need today. If you look at the the way banks are trying, like traditional banks are trying to turn digital, um, to turn Web two, if we keep using the Web three um, terminology, well, those banks actually can't compete with with fintechs, and fintechs basically are even fintechs. You, you can think of them as um, so. Basically, fintech today are you know getting those bricks, um, those bricks here, uh, and they're using. One of the words we mentioned, like for example, land or spend, or all of these fintechs are usually attacking one of these verbs and trying to disrupt banks, um, you know, individually. But if you look at the, if you think about the these fintechs, they're just reproducing the same model, the, the same, uh, you know, oligopolistic organization, the same data silos as traditional banks. They're just doing it at a small scale. So we think that in order to have a very innovative banking, uh, banking stack, banking system, you need to do more. You need something else. And we think that the missing link is actually, um, is actually crypto uh, for two main reasons. Because first, crypto has built-in incentives. So this is the thing which is missing in the traditional banking system. So uh, I mean, it's very, uh, it's very straightforward here. Because you have financial incentives, you have a lot of teams that are uh, you know, 
competing, um, uh, I mean, the, because you have built in incentives, you have a lot of teams that, are, that have a, you know, um, uh, building those crazy protocols, competing against each other because they have a direct interest in the, through token MX, to, they, they have a direct interest to see the token value increase, right? Um, so all this competition is enables also because you have permission, permissionless data. So again, if you go back at the, at the traditional banking system, you can see that you have huge data silos that are close to each other. Uh, and basically, the, the game is to try to protect these, these data silos to keep the user in. Here, anybody can basically jump into a protocol, just use the data, and make it better to build and use, again, composability to build a whole new stack. So you have this results in three main things. First, you have a, a high number of small teams that are really focused on one specific product one specific piece of software, and they, because again, they're gonna benefit from the creation, from the, the value, um, from the value increase of the token, because they're building the best product, that they're gonna build a huge ecosystem around them, while well, you have a lot of competition to do that. And this pushes innovation for WAB. Um, you know, if you look at, um, you know, we took, we took, a, we took a flight from, from SF two weeks ago, uh, and by the time we landed in Paris, you had TBTC, you had RDI, you had so many examples. I mean, the velocity of the space is phenomenal. And this is only due because you have a lot of small teams, uh, you know, fighting against each other at a very small scale. And, you know, all providing this brick of this piece of software that you're going to use um, to build your stack that we use to build our stack. Um, and, uh, yeah, this drives the decentralized finance uh, system forward at unprecedented levels. Uh, you probably have more innovation in one year than you would have in the traditional banking system in 20 years. This is fantastic. Uh, so it's. So why do we ask, Why are we so excited about this? Because, I mean, um, it enables us to choose the best option for our users, on a very regular basis. Uh, you know, we one of the key criteria for us is easy integration. Um, and we actually think that you know all those team building protocols should should actually prioritize this 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 ease of integration um, as you know as one of the main competing advantage. We one of the reasons why we used Kyber, for example, the Kyber network, is that their SDK is so easy to use and their team is so responsive that we took only one week to integrate this feature, which is core to our stack. We only took one week to integrate it to interact with our with our users that are receiving feedbacks, and this is the. This is what we want to apply for every uh, every new feature we need. I mean, in uh, in, in again in, in ten days we we uh, we launched the compound finance integration, which is a lending protocol I mentioned, um, and we were only able to do that because those teams focus on the ease of integration. Um, the cool thing about this is that you can actually take feature requests from your users, and again implement them in a very short amount of time. Uh, you can also test them. Um, you know, sometimes the user doesn't know about the features he will need, so you can actually test them. So that's the thing we did with insurance uh, with Nexus Mutual, which is the insurance protocol. Um, so we just we just launched it. Um, again, we're getting feedback, um, and if the user doesn't think it's worthwhile, uh, well, we just we just delete it and we build another feature in one week. So you have really short product cycle, which makes a huge difference again compared to traditional banking where uh, you usually need one year, two years, three years, and millions to ship a new feature. Um, so obviously, we, we have a, a lot of challenge. And those, those, two, those two challenges, challenges that most of you are probably familiar with. The first thing is, is obviously gas. Um, so we're not into the, 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 the gas is bad narrative. Uh, we think it's actually useful. That's the way you incentive teams to, you know, to keep improving Ethereum. Um, but if you look at our onboarding today, uh, it's a pain. Uh, and there's no way we can actually get non-crypto-native non, non -crypto -native companies on board, non-crypto users. Uh, you need to use parties. You need to use MetaMask to sign your transaction. You need to pay gas fees each time. Um, so for the onboarding, you need to deploy your initial smart contract. Uh, this takes a lot of time. Um, and it's actually super, super hard for the users to understand what it's dealing with. Uh, so we need, we need to, uh, to find a way to get rid of that. Um, so obviously, there are, the, the key question here is, how do you get rid of that? If you want to abstract it, either you can, um, one of the way forward is, that's the one we're considering, is actually to pay for the gas, because we're providing B2B services. So we want to provide a very seamless experience to businesses so they can focus on the product. Um, and not pay gas fees, so we probably do that on, the, on their behalf. 
Um, we're looking at options like um, uh, you know, the gas station network to do that. So we would have to become a relay. Um, so this is, but this is hard, and, and this is a key challenge we have today to, to get mainstream. Um, we can only talk to crypto native companies right now, because those are the only ones that understand what gas is about. Um, one, of the, um, one of the other issue we have is the MetaMask paradox. Uh, we call it the MetaMask par paradox because, again, we have two ways uh, to you know, identify yourself and sign transactions. It's either using MetaMask or Portis. Um, we actually recommend Portis because it's way simpler for the user. So MetaMask, you have a lot of a lot of people that are really familiar with the with the with the crypto uh, ecosystem uh, with, with crypto that actually know a lot about gas. So they, they they tend to use MetaMask because they think it's a you know like it's been it's been in a space for more time. It's a developer tool. Uh, you can have different kind of settings. Uh, so they use it and they try to speed up transactions or to modify those parameters that we pre set. Uh, and the thing is because of that, they. Um, so by changing those parameters, they make us unable to keep tracking the transaction. So they make us unable to onboard them. Uh, so basically, the transaction gets lost in the air. So they have to go back to uh, you know, the blockchain directly. They have to go around multis. They have to import the, you know, the address directly to the interface. Uh, so basically, we lose, again, users because people think that they know, um, you know gas fees, crypto, MetaMask. Uh, so my point is, is to say that gas is a huge challenge that we all need to work on somewhere because otherwise the, the, the cryptos never will, will never get mainstream. Uh, whether you know, um, you know and, and this applies to all kind of people, whether you know crypto or not. Um, I guess I could also mention the fact that gas is, uh, you know, it's jargon, so we need to get rid of all this terminology. Uh, we need to make sure that we use, you know, um, if we cannot abstract totally gas fees, at least we could call them network fees. Uh, we need to come up with some standards in the crypto space uh, that actually looks like um, uh, you know, the, the verbs, the, the, the words, the terminology that you use in a centralized world. So I used, uh, um, you know, we, we, we chose to label our features with traditional banking world, like checking accounts, savings accounts, business spending policies, because at the end of the day, the use case is exactly the same. Uh, and crypto is just a mean. So, um, I think it's really key for the whole ecosystem to, yes, build in a decentralized fashion using all those bricks that we're using, uh, using composability, but at the same time, you know, keep using those verbs that, has been, that have been there in the banking space for like 20, 30 years. We need to keep using them. Um, and I guess one of the key things here, um, I mean, we, we, we need to, to, to stop using this jargon and you know, to streamline the UX to avoid two things that we've seen a lot. Uh, with our users, uh, which are anxiety and frustration. So anxiety, basically, um, you know, we're helping we're helping companies and people manage money. And I guess, I mean, all these things are complicated. Um, and sometimes, when you're using different kind of smart contracts, I can give you the example of Compound. So when you, well, I show you how to to lend and withdraw money from the uh, from the interface. Um, we have some lag. Um, it's usually take a couple of seconds before actually seeing your balances updated. So for a couple of seconds, you feel like you've lost everything, all your assets. And this creates a lot of anxiety and stress for our users, and we have many complaints around that. So we need to, you know, to, to, to kind of prevent this anxiety so it can go through a better integration or, or maybe just small messaging explaining why it takes so much time to actually um, you know, process just transactions. Uh, one of the key things we've seen as well is frustration. Uh, people do not understand what we're doing. So again, we come back to this jargon. Um, and you certainly don't want your user to believe he's uh, dumber than he actually is, um, because you just want to make his life easier. Um, so those are the two main, main things we see on the UX side that we're actually constantly fighting against. Um, one of the other, I mean, yeah, so here just wanted to go back to the vision we have, which is we really want to merge crypto and fiat under the same roof, um, creating interoperability between those two fiat currencies. The um, thing is, to do that, you need obviously some fiat features. So the question is, how can we replicate the approach we have with crypto um, with uh, traditional um, traditional banking infrastructure? So we tried, we, we started to do that. We tried to. To, to take some, some pieces of software as well um, using existing infrastructure. So for example, we want to provide a fiat account. So we're going to use 
um, uh, companies like Solaris or uh, Quantis Group in the EU, which provide these kind of solutions directly, uh, white labeled. So obviously, we do not have the same uh, wide range of options that we we have with the with the um, you know with the crypto pieces of software we're using. Um, but we're trying to replicate this to ship faster. So again, if we go back to the to the fiat ramps we're building, we're using solutions like Ramp, Wire, MoonPay, um, and just you know conveniently putting them together with the crypto with the crypto with the crypto pieces we have already built. Um, the key issue we'll have is that because we're using different providers, different bricks, we need a lot of compliance processes. Uh, we will support different jurisdictions. Um, we um, KYC are very different from one company to the other because there's no standard. So we're struggling with this, uh, and we will find a, we will have to find a way. Uh, if we if we're putting everything under the same roof, if we want to provide a very seamless and convenient experience, we will have to find a way to provide a seamless KYC process as well. Um, so those are the two main challenges we see today. Obviously, there are many more. Um, we do not have you know um, answers for these yet. So I have to come back within one year and to be able to provide actual uh, you know, good practices for that. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is a, this is a presentation, a uh, quick overview on what, we, what we're doing, how we use compatibility, and why we think it's the way forward. Thank you. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? Monetization. Sorry? Monetization. Uh, so we will we'll take a cut on uh, on some financial services we provide if it makes sense uh, when the spread is big enough, for example. Um, but the main monetization will the, the most of the monetization will come through subscription. We'll provide premium features like accounting export, a CSV, APIs, um, you know, additional users to the wallet, uh, unlimited transaction, etc. Classic SaaS model. No, so that's it's one of the key compliance issue. We we will go around. Uh, I mean, for the time being, we're gonna ask from. Uh, we're gonna go with partners, regulated partners. Um, so if we use these partners, uh, we do not need a license because they already have it. Um, so fiat account, for example, we don't need to be a bank for that. We can use just we can just use the. It's pretty much like N twenty six or Revolut did back in the days. They they were really only focused on the interface. And they were using um, infrastructure provided by, I think there was Contis, uh, Contis Group uh, in the days. So it's a white label, a white label fiat account that they just plug uh, under the inter to the interface. So could I use like, uh, this banking, crypto banking to another company? Would it be like uh, um, compliant in terms of. Uh, uh, as a company, yeah, it will be 100% compliant. So that's why we're using different providers. So for example, if, we, if you're based in the EU, we use a, a provider called Ramp or MoonPay. So once you have done your KYB, your KYB uh, your KYC, um, once you've been accepted, you can convert crypto to fiat and then send fiat to your regular bank account. So Just like you would do from Coinbase, but this time adapted to a company. So in Europe, you're covered? Europe and US. Any insurance around any of the products that you're providing? So, if so, how, how do you manage that with a multi-party stack lines? So, so we do not have insurance ourselves. So, um, I, I guess you're, you're you're meaning like regular insurance yeah, on a product. Yeah, insurer on top of your stack. So no, we 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 don't for now. Uh, the only insurance we we provide is the Nexus, the decentralized insurance covering smart contracts. Um, since we're building only with smart contracts, we feel that this is a, a, a good way forward um, because essentially they could ensure every piece of our stack. Okay, talk about the importance of Bitcoin for, for this ecosystem and also you talked a lot about composability. Where do you see that going? Um, so we started, with, we started the, with Ethereum because for two things. First, this is where we, that's where the developers are today. Uh, you have a lot of 
you know, energy in this ecosystem and multiple teams building crazy projects that we rely on now. Um, and second, because you have so many teams, you have so many, uh, and because you can use smart contracts, you can do crazy things, you can, can, you can build multiple different bricks. Uh, we do not see that in the Bitcoin space. Um, you know, there's, you have some teams trying to do stuff to try to bridge those two worlds. You have RSK, for example, trying to, you know, make Bitcoin interoperable with, the, with Ethereum. Uh, this is moving pretty slow. Uh, so, in terms of Bitcoin support, I think the, probably the, the easiest option for us would be to provide some kind of custodian solutions. So again, using this again this concept of composability, we would uh, use BitGo, for example, um, and provide their um, you can call it custodian as a service solution uh, under our interface in a white label fashion. Uh, two quick questions. The first is, and just maybe clarifying. So you see this kind of as augmenting a business's traditional uh, banking relationship, right? Um, yeah, cool. Uh, second question is kind of how are you thinking about who your users are and who are you seeing be the most interested in this mm -hmm. at this stage? Um, basically, because it sounds like you're dealing with uh, problems of like high expertise of crypto natives and then like less crypto uh, crypto sophisticated, so just like how are you balancing kind of those people? So, maybe starting with the second question. So we basically our job is to make sure that you don't need expertise to use our solution. So that's the ultimate goal. Uh, we're struggling with gas. We're struggling with uh, uh, you know combining all those different bricks together. Uh, it's hard. Um, but the, yeah, I mean the goal is that we can actually use this solution. That like any company without any blockchain, crypto, prior knowledge can use this this kind of solutions. So this answer maybe to your first question as well, because we see that for the next 12 months, 18 months, companies using the solution are going to be crypto companies. So today we have, um, we have 3 million uh, of assets that are managed with our, with our multi-sig. Um, all of these funds are managed by crypto companies because they know, they know what they're dealing with, they know uh, gas fees, all these kind of frictions. They know that, they're familiar with it, so they accept it. They are the early adopters. Now, this being said, again, because we think that stablecoins are a game changer for business, uh, we think that crypto is actually the way um, it's, I mean, I guess everybody here shares this vision, but crypto is clearly the future of payment. It's good at least for this specific use case because you can send $100,000, you know, like in, in five minutes for like 70 cents. Um, so we think that any company, you know, any company is now natively global. Uh, you pay supplies abroad. Remote work is a huge thing as well. So we really think that within uh, two to three years, a lot of companies will actually have an interest to use this kind of solution. They will need a wallet to store and send the stable coins, and we will provide this wallet. So hopefully within two years, we'll be able to talk to more regular companies. Still a lot of work to do. Um, you talk a lot about composability and the innovation. Uh, and it seems to me that this is dependent on having all these teams continuing to work yep. with the same energy on the different bricks. Um, and it's, it seems easier to introduce business models and monetization on the user-facing side. But it seems to be a challenge to do the same on the bricks, mm. especially for some projects. How do you see that play out? Well, I guess that's the question revolving around like token economics. How do you make sure that your token actually has meaning and you can actually increase the value, right? Mm -hmm. um, so some teams are introducing more classic business models, like Compound, for example, to take a 10% fee on, on the pool. So this could be a way forward. But I mean, at the end of the day, the incentive is the same uh, because they, in order to keep, you know, uh, implementing the business model, in order to keep having this 10%, they need to build a great protocol. They need to keep improving on a daily basis. So it's obviously that the space is not going to be this big. In, I mean, some protocols will win, um, but they will have this constant incentives to keep innovating, so there was going to be catch up. I mean, if you look at Compound, uh, you know, the, the, uh, some Chinese developers made a copycat of Compound V1. They just translated the, the interface in Chinese and they're using the same thing. So the only way for Compound to survive this is to keep innovating and keep pushing V2, V2 V3, V4, V4. Mm -hmm. That's probably where the, where the, where the market's going to go. Are you imagining taking uh, positions in DAOs or some of these uh, building blocks so that you have a, an influence on the future direction of those products and services? So right now we have not, um, this is a good question. Um, 
I guess right now we're really focusing on building the product um, because we have many things to many things to work out, and I think our core expertise is actually on building those things and putting them together rather than trying to design the future of what a company could be. Uh, you have probably more uh, you know smarter people than us in the ecosystem, so I think it's maybe it makes sense to leave them doing that at least in the short term. It might make sense in the long term. Who knows? How receptive do you see non crypto native companies um, of a decentralized service that if they make a mistake, if it's some kind of mistake, everything would be gone? Yeah, so you need to, that's a good question actually. Uh, I, should, I should have covered it. You, you need to do some uh, you know, um, error prevention. Um, so again, because, because the, non, the non reversible nature of the transactions, you have to be super careful. You can send. So you, you need to add a, a, a bunch of features to make sure that errors don't happen. So one of them is obviously some messaging. So you need to do, like, are you sure? We actually, we actually have these kind of messages. Are you sure you want to delete this account? Are you sure you want to send this money? Are you sure you want to do this or you want to do that? Another way to mitigate this is actually the confirmation that you need from your um, multisig wallet. So that's a way to you know, add some kind of additional control. Um, and then you can add small features like the ENS, for example. Um, because you don't have to enter a very long chain of characters, um, you're basically reducing the risk of errors. So I guess, yeah, it's kind of risky because you cannot reverse transaction, but I'm sure we will we'll find some ways to you know, reduce the risk of errors to the minimum. Um, yeah. So it's like Argent, for instance, wallets, like smarter wallets can help as well. Yeah, I mean, what they're doing is right, so that's probably a, it's a good source of inspiration for us. Any other question? Cool. Thank you.